Okay, today we're talking about Lorentz transformations and relativistic momentum. So last time we learned a lot about uh, the basics of Einstein's special theory of relativity. Today we're going to put some teeth into that with some cool hardcore equations. Um, first, as a reminder, a lot of times when we do relativity, what we're doing is we're seeing how something appears in one reference frame and then trying to understand what would happen in another reference frame is viewed by somebody who's moving with respect to you. All right, so we start in a reference frame that we label the S frame, and some event happens, some space-time event, and that space-time event has coordinates. It has X, Y, and Z coordinates, and it happens at some time T. And we want to find out what's the position and time that that event occurred at uh, in some other frame we call the S prime frame. And just to remind you, for the sake of simplicity, we're going to assume some things. We're going to define this moving frame in a certain, uh, certain way. First of all, we're going to assume that the directions are the same. So the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction are the same in both reference frames. Also, to make life simpler, we're going to let the x direction in both frames be defined by the direction that the prime frame is moving with respect to the unprimed frame. So x is defined to be the direction that the S prime frame moves relative to the S frame. Also, we're going to have these two frames move in such a way that their coordinate, their origins will go past each other, and we're going to define time t equals zero in both frames as the time when those origins pass. So here comes the S prime frame and bang. When I said bang, that's when the origins overlapped. That is time t equals zero. Let's take a look at that again. Here comes time t equals zero now. Okay, so that's the convention we're going to use. Now, using that uh, convention, we can hopefully fairly simply come up with the Galilean transformations, the classical transformations that will take an event in one coordinate system at position x, y, z, and time t, and move them into another coordinate system, into the prime coordinate system, so that we can find x prime, y prime, z prime, and t prime. So basically, we know when and where an event occurs as measured in the S frame. We want to know when and where that event occurs in some other reference frame. <coughs> now, in the Galilean transformations, the classical transformations, you know, before relativity, um, three of these are, are trivial, right? Y prime has to equal Y, right? Because nothing's changing in the Y direction. And Z prime has to equal Z because nothing's changing in the Z direction. And of course, t prime is t, right? Because time is time in classical physics. The only slightly difficult one is x prime. If I have some event that occurs at some location, right, and some time, at time t equals zero, right, these two reference frames, the two coordinate systems overlap, and I would expect all of the coordinates to be the same. But if this happens sometime later, right, our prime frame is moving in the x direction, so if, if, the fra if, if this event happens at some time later than zero, then our prime frame will have moved over a distance v times t, right? Which means that this distance in the x direction will be smaller by an amount v times t. So we expect in the primed coordinate frame, x prime will equal x minus v times t. And there is the classical Galilean transformations. But of course they are wrong because Einstein discovered relativity and it turns out there's more to the story than what we just said. So um, the correct transformations, the ones that take relativity into account, are called the Lorentz transformations. Lorentz figured them out. My, the story I heard is that he was looking at Maxwell's equations. Remember I mentioned last time that you take the equations of electromagnetism, you can manipulate them to get a wave equation that describes light but those wave equations are kind of, that wave equation is kind of different from the wave equation we learned about in unit 1 because when you transform to different reference frames the speed of light doesn't change right a sound wave how fast it travels depends on how fast you're moving relative to the air but not so for light waves all right so lorentz figured out what transformations held according to maxwell's equations and those turn out to be the ones that follow relativity and they look like this all right, as you can see, um, x prime looks like x prime under the Galilean transformations, x minus vt, except there's this extra factor of gamma in front of it. That's kind of loopy, all right? 
y prime is y and z prime is z, so just like the classical case, x is different though, and t, this is really funky, t prime is not just t, right? It's more complicated. So we're going to use these transformations then to figure out if something happens in some reference frame, how does it happen in some other reference frame? A firecracker goes off at some position at some time. When and where did that occur in the prime frame, in this other reference frame, all right? So I have two events happen. A firecracker goes off here, a firecracker goes off here. How far apart were these two events and how, how much difference was there in time between the two events? I measure that in my reference frame. If you're flying by in a rocket at three quarters the speed of light, what would you see as the difference between the two locations that they occur and the time between the two events? That's what the Lorentz transformations can tell us, all right? So here's, I'm gonna work a couple examples of how to work with the Lorentz transformations. First of all, I'm going to show you that you can get time dilation from the Lorentz transformations. So last time we learned that if I have an if I have two events that happen at the same location, for example, I snap my fingers twice. They happen at the same location in my reference frame. If the two events happen at the same location, then the in my reference frame, then the time that I measure between the two events is known as the proper time. I'll call that delta t sub p, the proper time. We learned last time that if somebody in some other inertial reference frame, i.e. a reference frame in which is not accelerating, all right, if somebody in some other inertial reference frame, the time that they will measure between those two events is gamma times uh, the proper time. And recall, if you will, that gamma is equal to one over the square root of one minus v squared over c squared, okay? That's time dilation. Well, it turns out that time dilation is in the Lorentz transformations. The Lorentz transformations are all we need. We don't need this extra equation because it's embedded in the Lorentz transformation. So how can I show this? Well, let's imagine I have two events. I snap my fingers once, I snap them again, all right? So event one, all right, in my reference frame, it happens at some position and some time. Just for simplicity, let's define the position where it occurs to be, to be the origin of my coordinate system. And for convenience, let's let the time that it occurs be time t equals zero, all right? We're free to do that. I, ha I can define my coordinate system how I want, right? As long as the prime frame, you know, follows the conventions that we discussed earlier. All right, the second time I snap my fingers, I'm measuring the proper time, so that event happens at the same place as the first event. So if x1 is 0, x2 must be equal to 0. And then t2, well t1 is 0, that means that t2 is the time I measure be between the two events, so t2 is just the proper time. There we go. All right. When do these events occur in the prime frame? Well t1 prime is, the Lorentz transformation says it's gamma t1 minus v times x1 divided by c squared, all right? But t1 is 0 and x1 is 0, so this is all equal to 0. So t1 prime is 0, and that makes sense, right? The coordinate systems overlap anyway at time t equals 0, so if x1, x is 0 and t is equal to 0 in the prime frame, they're also both equal to 0. How about t2 prime, though? All right, that's going to be gamma t2 minus v x2 over c squared, all right? Well, x2 is zero, so that term goes away, and I'm just left with gamma t2, but t2 is the proper time, all right? So t2 prime is just gamma delta t proper, all right? Well, the time interval that I measure in the prime frame, that's the time dilated time, right? Delta t, that's just t2 prime minus t1 prime, right? So the time that I measure in the frame that's moving relative to the frame where the two events occur in the same place, that's delta t, and that's just the difference in these two transformed times. But the difference in the two is just gamma delta t proper. There we have it. There's the time dilation equation. And it came right out of the Lorentz transformations. All right, one more example of something you can do with the Lorentz transformations. I'm gonna show I'm going to come up with the length contraction equation. Remember we decided that if I have some object and I measure it in a frame where the object is at rest, I measure some length at the proper length, right? But if I'm in some reference frame in which that object is moving, in that reference frame, 
the object will be length contracted and we'll measure a length which is one over gamma times the proper length. All right, I can do that with, I can come up with that equation right from the Lorentz transformations. They are more general than this, okay? So here's how I'm gonna do my problem. Imagine I have some object, say a meter stick or something, and I wanna measure how long it is. Lorentz transformations tell me about events that happen in some location at some time. So I need to have some events that tell me about measuring this meter stick. So uh, let's have an LED on either side of my meter stick flash at some time, all right? So both of these two flash at some time. So I have two events. One event happens at x1, and let's let one side of the thing be at our origin, so let's call that zero. And it happens at some time, let's let the time where they flash be zero. The other event happens at x2, a distance L away from the first, from the other end of the meter stick. And that also happens at time t equals zero, all right? Now notice I did not write L proper, I wrote L. So the reference frame in which these two happen at the same time is the frame in which the meter stick is moving, right? Because if the meter stick is moving, I have to measure, to measure the length, I have to measure the position of both ends at the same time. If I'm in a reference frame in which the meter stick is at rest, it doesn't matter when I measure one end rather relative to the other end, right? I can measure one end where it is, come back an hour later, measure the other one. The distance between those two events is the length of my meter stick. It doesn't matter when I measure the two ends because they're not moving. But in a reference frame in which the meter stick is moving, I have to measure the location of both ends at the same time to determine the length, all right? So this is the reference frame in which the meter stick is moving. Now I just need to transform into the reference frame in which the meter stick is not moving, all right? So that's the frame when it doesn't occur at the same, where the two events don't occur at the same time. So let's find, I have these two events, that it, right? And in my reference frame in which the meter stick is, is not moving, right? These two events can happen at different times. I don't care about the time between them. I care about the distance between these two events because that will give me the length of my meter stick. In the, in the frame that measures the proper length, all right? So x1 prime is gamma times x1 minus vt1, right? x1 and t1 are both zero, so x1 prime is zero. x2 prime is gamma, you know, according to my Lorentz transformation, it's gamma x2 minus vt2, all right? Well, oops, that should have been a two there. Apologize for the confusion. T2 is also zero, right? Um, but X2 is L, so this is gonna be gamma times L, all right? Now, in this reference frame in which the thing is not moving, uh, the length, the proper length, it's just X2 prime minus X1 prime, right? And that is going to just be this minus this, which is gamma times L. So that tells us that the length contracted length, the length in this frame is one over gamma, the gamma over here times the length measured in the proper frame. So there it is. So here's two examples of working with Lorentz transformations to come up with something useful. Okay, now we're going to discuss communication faster than the speed of light. Imagine, if you will, that um, Captain Kirk is orbiting planet X and he gets a hyperspace message that says, hey, Planet X is a Klingon outpost, destroy it immediately, and so he does, all right? Then later on, it's discovered that Planet X actually wasn't a Klingon outpost, it was the home to a peaceful civilization, and Captain Kirk is on trial for genocide. Captain Kirk says, I only destroyed the planet because I got a message from Starfleet telling me to do this, I was just following orders. But some person flying by on a spaceship at some velocity V, they come to the tribunal and they say, well, yes, Captain Kirk did receive that order, but he destroyed the planet before he received the order because in my reference frame, the order was received before it was sent, all right? So what would have to be true in order for the order to be received before it was sent? Well, let's use the Lorentz transformations and think about this, all right? So I've got two events. One event is the order being sent. So let, that happens at Earth. Let's call the Earth our origin, all right? So that happens at x equals one, and let's let the time that the order is sent be time t equals zero. 
All right, but then the order is received. The order is received some distance L away from Earth, where Captain Kirk is. And when is the order received? Well, it depends on how fast the information traveled. So let's say the order is received at a time L divided by the velocity of the message. So the message, the information travels at some velocity Vm, and the time that it's received depends on how far away it, the Captain Kirk was and how fast the message was sent. All right, so let's say now I've got somebody flying by in a spaceship at some velocity v, all right? Where, let's see, we don't want where, we want to know when. When did they see the message sent, t1 prime? Well, we do a Lorentz transformation of this space-time point to find t1 prime, and that's just gamma t1 minus v x1 divided by c squared, all right? t1 and x1 are zero, so t1 prime is zero. So the person in the spaceship sees the message sent at time t equals zero. When do they perceive that the message is received? When do they observe that the message was received? All right, that happens at gamma t2 minus v x2 over c squared. All right, and t2 is L over vm minus v x2 is L divided by c squared, all right? So here's the deal. If we want to preserve causality, that cause happens before effect, that something happens after the thing I do that made it happen, right? If we want to preserve that, if we want the message to be sent before it's received, that means we must require that in any reference frame, t2 prime must be greater than t1 prime. The time the message was received must be greater than the time it was sent. So this minus this must be greater than zero. So gamma L over V message minus V times L over C squared, all right, minus zero, that must be greater than or greater than or equal to zero, right? This time must be greater than that time, all right? So that's, if we want things, the, 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 the message to be received after it is sent, which makes sense, then this is what must be true. All right, well, I can divide both sides by gamma. Gamma is always positive, so it won't change my sign here if I get rid of gamma. And then I can move this to the other side. This is going to be positive. So what we're left with is then L times V message has to be greater than or equal to uh, V L over C squared. Oh, and we can cancel out our L's too, right? L is positive, so... Um, we can cancel that out. And we're left with 1 over Vm has to be greater than or equal to V over C squared, where V is the velocity of the observer in the other frame. All right, so um, if this is bigger than this, then 1 over this is less than 1 over this. So I can change this equation to say the speed of my message has to be less than or equal to C squared over V. Okay, so if I look at this equation, what this says is um, if my observer is traveling very slowly, then I can send my message very quickly. But there's this potential that maybe there's some other observer out there that's moving more quickly, and we want to make sure that no observer in any inertial reference frame can see this message being received before it was sent. And so we have to consider all possible velocities of observers. Well, um, as we will find out very soon, it's impossible for our observer to move faster than the speed of light. All right, so we only have to consider velocities for our observers that go from zero to the speed of light, all right? When V is zero, it's okay to send the message instantaneously as far as that observer is concerned, but there may be some observer moving faster. The worst case scenario is what if I have someone observe the situation who's traveling very, very close to the speed of light compared to Captain Kirk and Earth, all right? So if I take the limit as v goes to c, then it's just c squared over c, and we find the velocity of our message has to be less than c. So the Lorentz transformations tell us then that not only can you not travel faster than the speed of light, information can't even travel faster than the speed of light. So sorry to spoil almost all of science fiction now. It is impossible to communicate faster than the speed of light. You can't spend in send instantaneous messages, all right? So if Captain Kirk is at some galaxy three light years away from the Earth, 
the Lorentz transformations, the laws of special relativity tell us that it's going to take at least three years for the message to get to Captain Kirk. Kind of annoying, right? Now, maybe this is wrong, right? Maybe our assumptions were wrong. But what assumptions did we make? First of all, we assumed that the Lorentz transformations are true. So far, every experiment we've ever done has agreed with that. The other assumption is that the message had to be sent bef before it was received. So if we're going to let communication travel faster than the speed of light, either special relativity is wrong and we found no evidence of the case, or we have to violate causality. Okay, now we're going to talk about velocity transformations. So imagine I have something moving at some velocity it measured in one reference frame. How fast is it moving in some other reference frame? So first of all, let's consider classical velocity transformations, the Galilean transformations. All right? So imagine, if you will, you are standing on the ground and you see someone throw a baseball at 50 miles per hour, mph. All right? Now imagine somebody drives by in a car and they are traveling at 30 miles per hour. In their reference frame, how fast is the baseball moving? Well, you think about it for a minute, you say, oh, it's just 50 miles per hour minus 30 miles per hour. So that's just going to be 20 miles per hour. All right? So it turns out um, in uh, the Galilean, the classical transformations of velocity, they say, if I look at the x component of velocity, and remember, our the frame, the prime frame we're transforming into is moving in the x direction. The x component of velocity in the prime frame will be the x component in our initial frame minus the velocity that we're of the frame we're transforming into. The y component of velocity doesn't change, and the z component of velocity doesn't change, right? If the baseball were going this way, we would see, oh, it's its y component of velocity is not different be just because I'm moving in this frame. However, the x component, right, if it were initially moving, if, if in the unprimed frame, if the baseball is moving this way, that would mean the x component of velocity is zero in the unprimed frame. But in the prime frame, it's going to be 30 miles per hour backwards, right? So these are the Galilean velocity transformations, but they do not take relativity into account. So how could I possibly come up with a set of transformations that take relativity into account? Well, okay, I'm going to get a little bit mathematical here, going a little bit beyond what you're expected to do on the homework, because I want you to understand, I want you to get comfortable with using mathematics to solve problems. That's one of the big reasons, I'm sure, that your major is requiring you to take this class. So I'm not going to disappoint the professors in your department. I'm going to show you a little bit of math, all right? So the x component of velocity Velocity is just the derivative of position with respect to time, right? So if I want to find the x component of velocity in the prime frame, what's that equal to? That's just going to be dx prime with respect to time, right? Almost. Okay, so velocity is a little change in position with respect to a little change in time, right? Divided by a little change in time. All right, so to find the velocity in this reference frame, I take you know, so let's imagine I have my baseball and it, in some short amount of time it moves from here to here, right? And I have some little dx that happens in some little time dt. In this frame, the change, that displacement will be different, right? Because the x is transformed differently, right? So I have these two events, the ball being here, the ball being here. Those two events will happen at different places in the prime frame. So my dx is going to be different in the prime frame. So I care about dx prime. But there's more than that. The time between these two events will also be different in the prime frame. So I also have to take my derivative not with respect to time in the unprime frame, but with respect to time in the prime frame. All right, so what I need to do to find the x component of velocity in the prime frame, I need to evaluate this, dx prime over dt prime. All right, to do that, I'm going to use the chain rule. If you recall, the chain rule says I can write this as dx prime dt times dt over dt prime, right? So instead of, I don't know how to take the derivative of this with respect to t prime, so instead I'm going to take the derivative with respect to t and then multiply that by how t changes with respect to t prime. That's the chain rule, right? You can kind of imagine these two can cancel each other out to get back where we started from. So if you recall, that's the chain rule from differential calculus. 
All right. Now, I have an equation for dt prime. I could solve that. I could, I could reverse my Lorentz transformation equations and find an equation for dt with respect to you know, t prime and take my derivative. But instead, I'm going to do things a little bit simpler. I'm going to write this as equal to this times dt prime over dt to the minus 1 power. So I'm going to calculate this and then flip it over to get this, right? If, if you know, t changes 4 hours per hour, then dt changes, dt is going to, prime is going to change 1 fourth of an hour per hour in t, right? So I can do this. I can flip my derivative over and then just invert it again, right, to get what I want. So first of all, what is dx prime dt? Well, x prime is gamma x minus vt, right? So dx prime, if you take the derivative of this with respect to time, I'm going to get gamma doesn't change with time, so that's gamma. The derivative of x with respect to time is ux, right? And then v is constant, so I take the derivative of this with respect to time, and I just get minus v, all right? So this looks a lot like the Lorentz or the Galilean transformation, except there's a gamma in front. But that's not the whole story. Now I need to know dt prime with respect to dt, all right? And so you recall my Lorentz transformation for t is t prime is equal to gamma t minus vx over c squared, right? So if I take the derivative of this with respect to time, I'm going to get gamma doesn't change. Derivative of time with respect to time is 1, all right? Take velocity's constant, c squared's constant, but if I take the derivative of x with respect to time, I get ux. So this is going to be minus v over c squared ux, all right? So ux prime then is going to be this divided by this, right? So it's this divided by this. The gammas cancel out, and I just get ux minus v divided by 1 minus v ux over c squared. So that's where this equation comes from, all right? And here it is. So here's the velocity transformation for the x component of velocity, all right? The y component of velocity, you kind of, maybe you thought to yourself, well, y, since y prime is equal to y, maybe uy prime is equal to uy, right? But that didn't turn out to be true because while the y coordinates of our events don't change, time does. So we have to take this thing and then divide by that derivative we found to convert time, all right? And similarly, the z component of velocity has this denominator there. So here are the Lorentz velocity transformations that allow you to say, look, I see a spaceship flying past me at 0.7 times the speed of light in my reference frame. How fast does the spaceship appear to be going in some reference frame which is moving with respect to me? A classical problem that I'm going to leave to you to do is imagine that I have a spaceship that's traveling at 0.9 times the speed of light in the negative x direction. So ux is negative 0.9 times the speed of light. So you, you observe that. Now imagine somebody flies in another spaceship going at 0.9 times the speed of light in the plus x direction. Let's transform into their reference frame. So v is going to be 0.9 times the speed of light. In their reference frame, how fast is that spaceship moving? If we use the Galilean transformations, it's going to be moving faster than the speed of light, which is a problem, right? We said nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. But if we use this equation here, if we use the correct transformation to find ux prime, all right, ux minus v will be greater than the speed of light in magnitude, right? But then we have to divide by this thing down here, which will keep us from having that spaceship exceed the speed of light. All right, that's something you can work on on your own. Okay, now, what two velocities can two people in two different inertial reference frames agree upon? All right, this is an interesting question. Well, first off, the magnitude of the speed at which those two reference frames are moving is going to be agreed upon, right? So if I'm in some reference frame and I see you in another reference frame and I say, oh, you're moving at half the speed of light relative to me, you have to see me moving at half the speed of light relative to you in the opposite direction. Why? Because in the theory of relativity, every inertial reference frame is equally good. There's no special inertial reference frame. The speed of light is the same. The laws of physics are the same in all inertial reference frames. So if you were to perceive me moving faster away from you than I perceive you moving away from me, why do you get to perceive the higher velocity and not me when our frames are equally good? All right, so in order to make things symmetric, we have to then 
except that we will measure our relative velocity to be the same. If I see you moving away from me at half the speed of light, you will see me moving away from you at half the speed of light. So the magnitude of the velocity uh, with which we're moving relative to one another, that's one thing we'll both agree on. The other thing we'll agree on, the other velocity we'll always agree on, is the speed of light, right? The speed of light in any inertial reference frame is the same. Speed of light in vacuum, that is. All right, so now, last thing we're going to talk about is relativistic momentum. So what's great about momentum, right? We learn in Physics 121 that momentum is mass times velocity. Why do we care? Well, it makes it easy to work problems because we've, you can show from Newton's second law that momentum is conserved. So we worked these great problems in Physics 121 where we said, let's imagine there's a car sitting still, another car you know, on a frictionless surface, another car smashes into it and they lock together. How fast is this heap of junk traveling after the collision? Well, you say, well, look, momentum has to be conserved. And so I can easily solve this problem using conservation of momentum. Well, it turns out, if you use your pro work your problem and find I, find the solution using the conservation of momentum, if then you use the Lorentz transformations to transform into a moving frame, and you say, what's the velocity of the two cars before and after the collisions, you'll find that if you use, if, if you transform the velocities, you'll find that momentum isn't conserved in your frame anymore. So momentum isn't conserved, it's useless to us, okay? So what we do is we say, well look, um, obviously momentum is not that. If we want momentum to be, to be conserved in all reference frames, it can't be that. It turns out the thing that is conserved in all reference frames is this right here. It's the momentum being defined as the mass times the velocity times gamma sub u. Now, I call this gamma sub u uh, rather than gamma. Your book just calls it gamma. I don't like that because to me, gamma is this thing we use when we're transforming from one reference frame to another. Here, this equation is not transforming from one reference frame to another. This equation is simply calculating what the momentum is in one given reference frame, all right? And this gamma sub mu, it looks like the gamma we use when transforming from one frame to another, but instead of having the velocity of the prime frame here, it has the velocity of the particle whose momentum we're trying to calculate. So I like to put that little u there to remind me that this is one over the square root of something, but it's the square root of one minus the velocity of the particle, not the velocity of the frame over c squared. All right, so that is our definition of momentum such that momentum will be conserved in all reference frames. All right, now, the correspondence principle says, we didn't notice relativity for a long time, so Newtonian physics ought to work pretty well if things aren't moving near the speed of light. In other words, if I take relativity, if I take equations from relativity, and take the limit where things are moving slowly compared to the speed of light, I better get Newtonian physics back. We better turn into Newton Newtonian physics. And this actually works, right? Because if we look at this, in the limit, as the speed of our object is very small compared to the speed of light, gamma u becomes 1. And if gamma u is 1, we get the classical definition of momentum back. All right? Now, you've probably heard it said somewhere that because of relativity, the faster you move, the more you weigh. All right? And that's this idea right here. Some people like to lump this gamma with the mass and say, hey, momentum is still mass times velocity, but your mass depends on how fast you're moving. All right? And so that's what they mean when they say the faster you move, the bigger your mass is. I do not like that interpretation one bit. Because if I'm moving really fast, in my reference frame I'm not moving at all, my mass is still m. All right? If you're seeing me move past you quickly, you say, hey, your mass is bigger. I say, no, it's not. It's the same as it was before I started jogging. Right? What's really happening is, in your reference frame, if you want to calculate my momentum in your reference frame, you need that factor there. And it's okay that my momentum is different in your reference frame and my reference frame, because I'm not moving in my reference frame. I am moving in your reference frame, so we should measure a different momentum for me, right? So the way I like to think about it is, the mass is just m, all right? Your mass doesn't change, but when you calculate momentum, you need this extra thing here. We're just defining momentum to be different than the classical definition of momentum. To make our language clear, when scientists discuss this, they will refer to this thing I'm calling m here as the rest mass. If they want to talk about mu sub, or gamma sub u times m, they will refer to this as the relativistic mass. 
all right? And then if you ask a scientist, does your mass get bigger when you run faster? The, they'll ask, do you mean the rest mass or the relativistic mass? The rest mass does not, the relativistic mass does. But if you're in my camp, you'll say, but the relativistic mass isn't really your mass. It's just something that you use when you calculate momentum. And now I will get off of my soapbox and let you come up with your own interpretation that makes you feel good about relativistic momentum. All right, good luck with the homework. All right, now, I said good luck with the homework. That sounded like I was finishing, and I sort of am. I, uh, I'm done with what you need for this class, but there, I'm going to show you something really cool. If you have a few more minutes that might help you kind of see some cool symmetries in Lorentz transformations and maybe remember them better if you have to write them down, okay? So the Y and the Z Lorentz transformations were easy, so why bother with them? But let's look at the X and the time transformations. They look like this, right? Well, here's a cool thing you can do. Instead of writing them in terms of time, let's write them in terms of C times time, right? T is just C times time. I multiply C times time that has units of length, right? It has units of meters, right? So if I have any event that happens, I can write its position in space-time as a four-dimensional vector, x, y, z, and c times time. So now time has units of length, if I, if I kind of put a c with it, and I can kind of think of an event as happening as a point in four-dimensional space, all right? Okay, now, if I rewrite these equations, writing them in terms of c times t instead of t, the x equation looks like this, right? So I replace t with this right here, c times t, but then I have this 1 over c that I have to include, and I'll lump that with the velocity, and I just get x minus ct times v over c. All right? To do the same thing to the time equation, I'll just multiply both sides by c, and I'll get c times t prime is equal to gamma c times t minus Ah, that cancels out one of these c's, and I just have x times v over c. So you notice the symmetry. For the x equation and the velocity and the c times t equation, all I do is I swap the positions of x and c times t. All right, there's a symmetry there. In fact, if you write the coordinates of, a, of an event as a four-dimensional vector like this, you can transform into another reference frame by taking your initial vector and multiplying by a matrix. All right, so if you've done linear algebra, here's a really quick way to calculate uh, transformations. All right, so what is that matrix? I can find my space-time coordinate and my prime coordinate by taking my initial coordinate and operating on it with this matrix right here. And it's a very simple matrix. There's a gamma out front. It has a diagonal of one. And then I just have these two off-diagonal elements. So anyway, cool things you can do with Lorentz transformations by recognizing if you multiply time by c, you get, you get something with length units. And then suddenly, time and x have the symmetry. So anyway, hope you thought that was cool.